we're not going to do the, the Q&A. You know, we're not um, going to really have discussion. It's just going to be pretty much a straightforward lecture slash sermon because there is going to be an application in this as well. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is draw from the different things that we have seen up to this point and <clears throat> some things we haven't actually seen. <clears throat> I've been listening to other apologetic series and um, found maybe a couple of interesting things that um, we might use to sort of strengthen this, these arguments and maybe more will occur as, <laughs> as we're going through these. So anyway, that's, that's how we're going to proceed. So this, as I said before, is um, a new series, really a continuation of an old series. What I want to do is I want to kind of fill in the areas that R.C. didn't really have the opportunity to fill in um, because his 32 lectures just wasn't enough time. Um, and, and that would be on the parts that have to do with the Scripture being the Word of God. But I, again, I want to get a running start. I want us to kind of review some of the things that we have seen. So what have we seen? Well, we, we did begin this series of, of uh, well, lectures, videos, presentations on apologetics with creation science. I don't know if you, were, if you remember that. Okay, I think that was in 2019. So I guess I think you're all here at that time. And we were watching the series called Re-Engage by the Answers in Genesis group. It was a seminar they put on in 2017. It was really very, very good. I can't possibly rehearse everything that was in that, but what, what they did in that series was give us a good look at the scientific evidence that the only competing view to creation, and, and really there's only, there's only one, and that's, um, you know, instead of uh, intelligent design, it's uh, random chance. Uh, uh, e the eternality of all things and random collision of atoms over a limitless period of time brings about everything you see right now, and that's called evolution. Well, they pointed out the scientific evidence shows that that position cannot be true, at least on the evidence presented um, by the evolutionists themselves. And I just wanted to remind us of a couple of things, and this may or may not make any sense. I, I hope it, it does, does make sense, but you know that the theory of evolution says that if you have enough time, anything can happen. I mean, that, that's essentially what, what they're saying. Of course, you also need matter and energy. You need a lot of things for this to work. So they're presuming all these things are there, okay? Well, they get their time from what's called the radiometric dating methods, and that's just simply a fancy term for there's radioactive decay that's going on, and they believe that, that those materials that are decomposing are chronometers, that they tell us how old the creation is. But let me just remind you, you know, of a few th critiques that are just hopefully simple that if anybody comes to you and tells you, you know, the uranium dating method tells us that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old or, or that carbon-14 says, you know, that, um, well, that these particular organisms are 20 million years old or whatever it may be, that, that these things are not necessarily true. Let me just give you this example. It was, it was pretty good. In, in um, the college I went to, the professor one time when we came into the class, creation science class, trying to make a point, he had a candle that was burning Maybe I, you remember me using this illustration before. And he said, this candle burns at the rate of one inch per hour. So he says, how long has this candle been lit? Okay, well, in order to understand that, you'd have to know how long was the candle to begin with? And um, has the, the candle been burning at the same rate uh, from the time it was lit? You know, there are certain things that you don't know, and so assumptions that have to be made and the answer to the question is you really can't tell because you need to know that information. Well, the same thing is true with regard to these decomposing radioactive elements. We don't know uh, how much, and, and by the way, when they decompose, you have the original, the original substance, let's say like the uranium, and that's called the parent. And then what it decomposes into are called, is called the daughter, okay? So you have parent atoms and you have daughter atoms. And then the question is, well, how much of the parent and how much of the daughter did you have to begin with? You don't know. Okay, that's an unknown. Secondly, how much of the parent atoms have been lost 
and how much of the daughter atoms have been added because this compound that's decomposing is not decomposing in a vacuum. It, it actually is, um, it's not a closed system. There, there's, there are things interacting with it and it's changing the amount of each and that's throwing things off. And then we also don't know if the decay rate, like the candle burning, has always been the same. You know, it is something that could change over time, but there's no way that we can tell because we haven't had enough time to observe. So the, the bottom line is radiometric dating methods, as we were told, really cannot prove to us how old things are. They are not very reliable. Plus, if we had time to get into it, which we don't, there are many chronometers that are accurate in the world that show us that the Earth is relatively young, less than 10,000 years old, which the evolutionists will dismiss immediately because he needs time for life to, to be you know, created, so to speak, and then to evolve into what we have now. The other thing they critiqued was the fossil record. Um, the idea that, um, you know, the fossil record gives us a nice a uh, clear uh, record of evolution as it moves from simple life forms to more complex life forms. Um, but what they pointed out, and this is something I remember from college, is that fossils are only formed when a living organism or one that has recently died is suddenly buried in moist soil so that the uh, basically the, uh, the rock-like chemicals that are in the soil can replace the living tissue that is in, the, um, in the, those organisms and turn them into stone. That's exactly what fossils are. So what the fossil record actually shows us is that there were many fully formed creatures that were suddenly buried at some point in time. And as to the fact that they, they sort of change from real simple organisms and move through to more complex and mammals and so forth is it shows where or when they were buried in this catastrophe in relationship to one another. The more simple organisms being closer to the ocean, the more complex making their way up to higher ground before they get buried in the waters of the flood. So the fossil record really does show us not evolution, but it shows us catastrophe. It shows us sudden burial. And by the way, S sudden burial of fully formed organisms. There are no intermediate life forms at all in the fossil record. There's, there's no, you know, uh, you know, this sort of like organisms that move from a lizard to a bird or from, a, a, let's say, a whale to a cow or maybe from some amphibious creature to a cow and then back to a whale. I think that's the way they... They think that whales actually came, came about. They, they made their way to land, became mammals, and then they made their way back out to sea and became aquatic mammals. Okay, so they, there's all this idea that there's these small changes that take place and each of these changes gives the organism an advantage and they're the ones that survive, but you don't see any of these intermediate life forms in the fossil record. And if evolution were true, you would find probably more of those than you would find of anything else. Okay, there's none. So the fossil record... It does not prove evolution. As a matter of fact, it speaks against it. There's a lot more that could be said about the fossil record, but the other thing the series pointed out, I think, is one of the best arguments for creation, and that is the one based on information science, the DNA molecule. Now, that I'm going to add to our argument tonight, so I'm not going to spend any time on it here. Now, that's what we did originally. We went through creation science. It was very, very good. It uh, gives us ammunition to fight against the false worldview. But next we went through Sproul's Defending Your Faith. And I think we did take a year off for, for COVID. Uh, so we didn't do it that particular year. But then we went through Sproul's Defending Your Faith. And you remember that was a very lengthy one. And he taught us how to build an argument for God's existence from reason. As well as how to prove the Bible is God's word. And he said that that was really 98% of, of the apologetic effort. You know, the, the two main things that we need to do is, is demonstrate God exists, demonstrate the Bible is his word, and he says the rest of it then is taken up in simply interpreting what God's word actually says. Now, we're going to review some of those arguments tonight, so I'm not going to spend any more time on that. And then last year, 
we watched R.C.'s The Last Days According to Jesus. Now, that was fun because it was a study on eschatology, and that's always enjoyable. Um, but it also gave to us a very powerful apologetic for the Bible. And one of the ones that we're going to look at in, in this series that we're, we're doing now, and that is the prophetic evidence. Because of Jesus' clear prediction of the destruction of the temple, and that within a certain time frame. Remember in Matthew 24, let me just read the opening two verses and then the important verse. They're all important, but, but the one that really nails us down. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away with his disciples, uh, and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to them, to him. Excuse me. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Truly, and then the important verse here, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And that certainly includes the destruction of the temple. Now, those then living, that generation, would not die, they would not pass away, until all these things, including the destruction of the temple, took place. Now, Jesus said this clearly 40 years, at least 40 years before it actually took place, and it happened exactly as he said it would. By the way, if we had time to get into all the details in between verses 1 and 2 and verse 34, you'd see all these things. We, all those things actually did take place. And when they destroyed the temple, not one stone was left upon another. And that was, as I understand it, because they set fire to the temple, the fire melted the gold, the gold ran into the cracks, the Romans wanted the gold, and so they took the temple apart to get to it. Okay, so it happened just as Jesus said, and that's not the only fulfilled prophecy in Scripture, but that is a very easy one, okay, to point to. So we looked at that as a part of the apologetics. Now, what we're going to do in this series, as I mentioned already, is, first of all, we're going to review some of the arguments for God's existence, some of them, not all of them. There's, there's lots of them. We're going to draw from these studies we've looked at. I've already given you a couple of things, but uh, we're going to draw on them for others, as well as other sources that uh, we haven't looked at. And I'm going to try to lay that out this evening. Okay, so that's what we're going to attempt this evening. And we're also going to note from what Paul says in our text what this evidence can do and what it can't do and how we should use it, okay? Next week, we're going to review the arguments that R.C. gave us for the Bible being God's Word, and then from there, we're going to take a deeper dive. We're going to start to go more deeply into those areas that he only touched on briefly during his apologetic series, okay? And then from there, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to look at the doctrine of Scripture. If this is the Word of God, what must be true? You know, um, what must be true of the Scriptures, because it is the Word of God, how should we understand it? How should we respond to it? We should respond to it, of course, as God Himself speaking to us. Take it very seriously. But uh, we will, I think, to the degree that we are fully convinced that it is His Word. Now, again, this should help us, I think, for a couple of reasons. We need to be convinced before we're going to give it the attention that we should. Sometimes we need a wake-up call. But secondly, we need to convince other people. Paul tells us in our text that no one has an excuse for their unbelief and sin. No one. R.C. said in the series that he did on apologetics that only a very small percentage of people actually claim to be atheists. I, I can't remember the exact percentage. It was either 4, 6, or 8 percent. So a small group of people. I think it was 4. Not as many as you would think. That, that say, I'm an atheist, I don't believe God exists. Most people believe that God exists, at least in the, um, the Western world, and I imagine in the, maybe in the non-Western or the third world countries, it's probably even more, right? Probably everybody believes in, in some kind of God, some kind of higher power. But among these people who know that God exists, most of them reject the Bible as being God's Word. So we need to be able to show them that it is God's Word. So tonight we're going to look at three things. That God has revealed Himself in the creation. Secondly, that everyone sees the evidence and knows that He exists. And thirdly, 
that everyone is without excuse. Okay, so first of all, God has revealed himself in the creation, but on your thinking caps, okay? Paul writes this, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. And what Paul is saying here is that from the time God made what he made, and there was an audience to see it, okay, even before there was an audience, okay, he has been revealing himself, he has been showing himself. Even though he is invisible, even though his attributes are invisible, he can be clearly seen through the creation, his eternal power and divine nature. Now, as I've said before, we've gone through these evidences before, most of them, not all of them. And I think we should recognize them. I, I, I hope we, we recognize them. That's a good thing. <laughs> okay? w there are steps in learning. You know, we understand that. You have to hear it, and then the next time you hear it, you recognize that you heard it. But as we progress, we need to understand these arguments, and we need to remember them. And you, you really can honestly say that you know them until you can explain them to someone else, okay? So we'll see whether I know them tonight as I try to explain them to you, okay? So again, we, we want to understand these things for our well-being. I, I can't tell you the number of times that general revelation has been helpful to me. When Satan comes in, the flesh comes in, tries to tempt you, there is no God, just open up the window, look out the window, look at, look at the creation, and it's like, oh, there's just no way. You know, God must exist. There's just no way. He cannot exist. Okay, so it, it helps to strengthen us and, and our faith in case we're tempted. But we need it for the well-being of others as well. Because even though these things are clearly seen, and they're even understood through the creation, Paul tells us that sin makes people want to hide or cover over these things. Okay? As a matter of fact, one of the greatest um, sinners, I hate to put it that way, but who tried to cover over all these things was one of the, one of the so-called great philosophers of the Enlightenment called Immanuel Kant, or I should say named, who said that because God is outside of the realm of our senses, that there's no way we can know Him, there's no way we can prove He exists, we can only look at the things down below. Well, the thing is, we can't see the invisible God with our senses. That's true. But we can see from what He has made that He must exist. So, sin makes people want to cover these things, to hide these things, to put them out of their minds, even to develop arguments against them. But if we want to help people find the Lord, we do need to provide those answers. Remember the text that R.C. used in the series, that we need to be ready, as Peter tells us, to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Okay, and let me just say secondly, before I start this line of argumentation, that there are, I should say many of these arguments, are from reason, okay? And that can make them kind of hard to wrap our minds around, okay? Um, it, they're harder to understand, but they're easier to prove. And that's, that's the point. That's why R.C. was, you know, uh, going about it this way. He would say, um, there's two ways you can go about proving God. Inductively, you could, you could search the entire universe and look under every rock and behind every star looking for God. And that's one way to try to discover whether God exists. Another way is, is to prove that he must exist from reason, that it cannot be otherwise. And I, I think you would admit that's going to be a little bit easier than exploring the universe looking uh, for him. So we can't show somebody that the invisible God exists by showing them the invisible God because he's invisible, right? But we can point to the reasons that he must exist. So how can we know he exists? And how, what can we know about what he's like from the creation? So here's, here are, again, a series, a series of arguments. I'll do my best to try to make them understandable. If you don't understand some of them, don't worry about it. Some of them, you know, I, I think you will be able to see quite easily. 
Some of these things come from Sproul. Some of them come from Gerstner. Um, one of them is going to come from the seminar that we saw, at least the supplemental video that we watched on the DNA molecule. So first, and this is where RC began, something exists now, okay? Because something exists now, then something has always existed. I hope that point is clear, okay? Something cannot come from nothing. If there was a time in the past when there was absolute nothingness, then there could be absolutely nothing now. There, there's an axiom, a truth, a truism that goes this way. Out of nothing, nothing comes. You've heard ex nihilo, nihil fit. Okay. The Latin doesn't mean much to us, but it means out of nothing, nothing comes. If there was a time when there was nothing, there could be nothing now. And that means if something exists now, then something must always have existed. Okay? I think that, that part is, is clear and easy to understand. There must be something that is eternal. Now, R.C. pointed out, and we're not going to run into many people like this, but apparently there are people like this, that even if what we see is an illusion, some people say everything is an illusion, there would still have to be someone having the illusion. And if there is someone having the illusion, that means that something exists. And if something exists, that means that something has always existed. So even if there is, if everything we see is an illusion, it still doesn't change anything, okay? All right, so first of all, there is something that is eternal. Secondly, this eternal something must be everywhere. It must have no limits. It must be infinite. And that is because of the impossibility that there could be nothing somewhere, okay? That there could be nothing somewhere. Now, to understand this point, and I think if we can get this concept, we'll understand this is really a, a quite a powerful argument. Okay? We have to understand what nothing is. <laughs> and the problem is you can't really understand it because you can't describe it because nothing is nothing. You cannot really say nothing is because nothing and is are contradictory. I hope you see that that's true. Nothing is, is not. It's not something that is. Okay. Now, nothing is not empty space, okay? We have to understand that. Empty space is something. You can talk about it. You can describe it. It has height. It has width. It has depth. It has density or the lack of density. It's actually zero, you know, zero density if there's nothing in that space, okay? So the thing is, you cannot talk about nothing. Whenever you try to describe nothing, you're actually talking about something. Okay, now that's where the brain twisting comes in a little bit. So think about this. Edward's definition of nothing, what the sleeping rocks dream of. Okay, what do sleeping rocks dream of? Nothing, okay, there's nothing. It, it, it's... it's not even space, right? Okay, it's, it's absolute nothing. Now, the thing is, there cannot be anywhere where there is nothing. As I mentioned before, here's another thing. Where and nothing are contrary, you know, contradictory terms. You can't have nothing anywhere because nothing doesn't exist. It can't be anywhere, okay? And that's the point. That means that there must be something everywhere. Okay, so what that means is that this something that has existed from all eternity, because something exists now, something must have always existed, is also infinite. Okay? Can't be any limitation. Now, if you got that down, the rest of it should be fairly easy. <laughs> okay. Third, there can only be one such eternal and infinite something or being, okay? Some, we call that simplicity, divine simplicity. It can only be one. Because if there were two or more, these beings would limit each other, which means they would be finite. 
And when you have finite beings, it doesn't matter how many you have of them, you can never add enough of them together to make something that's infinite. Okay? If it's finite, it cannot be this eternal and infinite being that must exist. Okay? So it has to be one. There has to be one such being, one such existence, cannot be finite, again, because of the limitations. All right. Can, I hope you see that. Okay. Now, that means, okay, we have an eternal, infinite, and simple being. Now, this eternal, infinite, and simple being that must exist must not need anything else to exist. It must be independent. It must be self-sufficient. It must have everything it needs for its own existence in itself. And that's because being the only being that exists, again, because there can't be two, there can only be one, right? There's nothing else on which this being could depend for its existence. It has, it, the reason for its existence must be within itself, okay? One infinite, uh, eternal, infinite, simple, self-sufficient being, okay? I hope Hope you're with me so far. Now, the reason why I'm building this argument is because we're going to look at what actually is in the universe and what it is that scientists believe is the origin of where we came from, and we're going to see that this thing they're pointing to doesn't have any of these attributes. Okay. Now, fifth, this eternal, infinite, simple, independent being, which we don't know if he's personal yet, we, we're going to get to that, must never change must be immutable because if it were to change it would have to have a reason to change it would have to interact with something in order to change but if it's the only being that exists there's no reason that it would ever change and there is nothing that could possibly change it so being infinite it must be all being infinite there's nothing else that exists besides it there's nothing around that could possibly change it. Okay, again, now don't, if, by the way, if you want a copy of these arguments, let me know. I will provide those for you. Six, this eternal, infinite, simple, independent, and unchangeable being cannot be the material universe. It cannot be the matter. It cannot be the stuff that we see in the universe. Okay, why? Well, because it doesn't have any of those attributes, does it? Matter is not eternal. I, I don't know, I think we, we uh, noted that when we were in the series, that scientists believe. I think the prevailing theory is that there was a time when there was nothing, and I think by nothing they probably mean empty space. But even empty space is something. But they believe there was no matter, and then suddenly there was a fluctuation in nothingness and matter sprang into existence, okay? So out of nothing, something comes, which is absurd, right? That's self-creation. And as R.C. pointed out, for something to create itself, it would have to exist and not exist at the same time and in the same relationship. Something that doesn't exist cannot be the cause of something that does exist, okay? That's why... If something exists now, something must have always existed. So, scientists believe matter is not eternal, but it sprang into existence at some point in time. And I think you could probably use the law of thermodynamics and see that everything's running down and, and so forth. Okay. Secondly, matter is not infinite. It's finite. I mean, just take a look out into space. And what do you see? You see a lot of empty space. Okay. So... Matter is not infinite. It's not one being that fills the entire existence. So it can't be this being that's existed from all eternity. Okay? It's not simple. It's not one. But it's made up of many parts. Again, just look at the clumpiness uh, that's out in the universe. It's not independent, but it's dependent. If, in fact, these things came into existence at some point in the past... It depends on that which brought it into existence. So it is dependent on something else. We've already seen this being that we've been talking about cannot depend on anything else because there is nothing else uh, upon which it could depend. Okay? And let's see. 
Matter also is not unchangeable. It's constantly changing as it interacts with other pieces of matter. I mean, think about what happens when you take fire and you put it to wood or straw or something like that. It, it changes, okay? Well, this being it cannot change. So this material universe cannot be this, this being. All right. Now, since the, the, the material universe cannot be this being, then this being must be the cause of the universe, okay? Now, this being is eternal, infinite, simple, independent, and unchangeable. It must be the cause of the things that we see. It must be the cause of the material universe because, as we've already seen, it is the only being that could be the cause. It's the only being that exists. There's nothing else that could be the cause. So you might say it's the only applicant for the job. I've been referring to this being as an it, but we're going to get to um, personality here right now. Eighth, this eternal, infinite, simple, independent, and unchangeable being must be personal. Must be aware of its own existence, and I suppose at this point I should change the pronoun, say, must be aware of his existence. Must be intelligent, must be purposeful, must be moral. And here's an argument I think we can all grab onto very easily because we are all these things. Okay, we possess these attributes. And we know that whatever caused us must have these attributes because we know that whatever is in the effect, must be in the cause. You cannot have a greater effect than the cause. Okay, that is an, another axiom, another principle that is accepted by science. We have no exceptions to that. Okay, so if we find these things in us, they must be in whatever created us. I, I think I told you that I used this argument on someone who believed in evolution one time, and I said, so you believe that uh, we evolved out of this out of the earth, out of this, this ground, and uh, you know, the sun hitting, the rays hitting, providing energy, this random energy colliding over long periods of time, eventually you get to us. And, and they said yes, and I said, well, would you agree with me that um, it's impossible that whatever um, caused us would be less than us? You know, would you agree with me that that for every effect, there must be a cause that is great enough to explain it. And they said, yes. And I said, well, do you believe that there's personality in the earth or in the sun? Do you believe it's intelligent? Do you believe it's moral and purposeful? Well, well no. And I said, well, then how could we have come from that? So here's, here's another argument against evolution. It, it, it gives you something greater, doesn't it? I mean, that's what evolution is all about, from something less to something greater, to something far greater than, than the, you know, the rocks and the sand and, and the rays of the sun, okay? So whatever caused us must have the attributes that we possess. So this being must be a person, okay? So, and ninth, and here's where I, I bring in that argument from the uh, in, in, uh, information. He must be intelligent. We already saw that must be wise, must be purposeful, must actually know a lot. <laughs> okay, why? Because we see information everywhere. We see information encoded on a molecule that's called the DNA molecule. That molecule which is present in, in the, every living cell of every living thing. And that molecule, at least in human beings, has enough information that is encoded on it to fill a thousand volumes. I mean, look in, I don't know if we even have a thousand volumes. We, we might in the library. Just picture all of those books in the library, each of them having 500 pages, every page filled with complex chemical reactions. All of that information is encoded on every strand of DNA in every cell, every one of the trillions of cells in your body. Each one of them contains a blueprint to build you and to build me, and to build whatever it happens to be a part of. 
Now, it's been pointed out that half of that information that is encoded in there is, is really instructions on how to use the other half of the information. That's amazing. Okay, you got all this information, you've got instructions on how to use part of the information. You have a context, you have a system that understands the information, right? Because it would be, you know, what would you say, Greek? You know, it would be Greek to me if, if I tried to read it. Uh, I wouldn't understand it because it's not in a language I understand. But, but here it is in a language that is understood by those elements within our cells that need to use it. And the machinery is also present at the same time to use that information to build these organisms. Okay? So information can only come from information. And so it must come from a being with intelligence. And of course, design tells us quite plainly that this being is a purposeful being. And certainly the way that he's made us, infinitely wise. Okay, so this being from, from the creation we've seen is eternal, infinite, simple, independent, unchangeable, personal, self-aware, intelligent, purposeful, moral, um, yeah, and moral, okay. So he has all of these attributes. He's also wise, okay. Now, that's just his, his being. What about his character? You know, what can we learn about his character from the creation? Well, first of all, we know that he must be morally good because he's given us a conscience, a conscience that, that is informed somehow about what is good and what is evil. And whenever we do what is good, our conscience makes us feel good. And when we do what's bad, our conscience makes us feel bad. Now, this shows us that this being who gave us this conscience, the one who made us, approves of what is good, but disapproves of what is evil. By the way, that certainly is what the Bible teaches, but we're just looking at what, you know, we know from the creation. Secondly, he must be benevolent. This was um, Gerstner's argument because God gives not just to his people, but to everyone, much more pleasure than pain. He said he could have made me, he's talking about himself, to experience pain every time I take a breath. But he says, when I take a breath, it's, it's pleasurable, it's enjoyable. When I eat food, it's enjoyable. He could have made that to be bitter and horrible, and he could have made life miserable for us, but he gives us all these good things. He, he is good. He is benevolent. And again, I would point to that um, hymn that we sang, O love of God, how strong and true. There are many, many ways in which God shows his kindness and mercy, which our Lord Jesus Christ tells us in the Sermon on the Plain. He is kind to ungrateful and evil men. And James says every good gift bestowed, every perfect thing comes down from the Father of lights. Now, thirdly, he must be angry because in the midst of this world with all the good things that he has made, we also see things that aren't so good, indications that perhaps he's displeased. Not only the, the guilt we feel when we do what's wrong, not only, well, but add to that the fact that we grow old and die, we get sick, there are famines, hurricanes, earthquakes, floodings, things like that, that can kill people, you know, so we know all is not well in paradise. Something is wrong. This being is angry. Conscious, conscience teaches us that he's angry because of the wrong things that we have done. That's the reason why these things are happening. Now, fourth, he must be just because being good and approving of the good and being angry with the wrong or the sin, we know he punishes it. That's why we see the things we see in the world. They're, what are they but preludes to an even more catastrophic judgment at the end of time, which we're not going to be able to discover absolutely until we get to the Scriptures. Fifth, and this is, I thought was an interesting argument from John Gerser, that creation shows us that God wants us to turn away from the wrong things that we're doing, not only because we feel bad when we do them, we feel good when we do the right thing, but because of the time that he gives us. If God had created us only to destroy us, then he would destroy us. He wouldn't give us time. 
So why does he give us time? And why does he show us all of these emblems of his kindness and mercy towards us? It's because he may be disposed to being merciful to us. Perhaps he wants to enter into a relationship with us. And again, that's something we can only discover from Scripture. And then finally, everything that this being, we'll call God, possesses, he must possess to an infinite degree. And I think we can also deduce that by reasoning from what we know about this being, because we know he's infinite. And being infinite, that means that everything he possesses must be infinite. Can't be an infinite being and know just one fact, especially when we consider all the information that we see encoded in our DNA. So he must have infinite knowledge, infinite wisdom, infinite power, infinite goodness, as well as being infinite with regard to time and space, as we have seen that he is, in fact. And of course, if he is the cause, which we believe he's the, only, he's the only one who could possibly be the cause of the material universe, the material universe is a display of his great power. But of course, that's infinitely easy for him to do, being an infinite being. So these are just some of the things that we can see about God from the creation. Now, again, you know, there are simpler arguments, but um, I think these show us God's greatness, something of his glory. It shows us that you really can't look to evolution. You can't look to the, to the earth. You can't look to time, to the sun's rays, to explain the things that, that we see because they're so much greater than those things could ever be the cause of. All right. Now, Paul tells us, secondly, that everyone sees this evidence of God's existence. They know that he exists. They may not be able to formulate these arguments, but they do know they didn't cause themselves. They do know that they are dependent upon something else that is the cause, and they know that that cause must be sufficient to account for everything that we see. Okay? So that part of it is, is clear. They understand. Okay? They know that he is through what he has made. And Paul says that revelation gets through, which means that everyone in the entire world is without excuse. You know, no one can legitimately say, God, I didn't know you existed. Um, I didn't know what it is you wanted me to do. Uh, everyone knows, apart from Scripture, through general revelation, which means everyone is accountable. On the day of judgment, no one will have an excuse. If uh, Well, there are going to be people who have never heard the gospel on that day, who have never been reached. Many of them have already died, and many of them are yet to die. That's the reason why we do missions. They're not condemned because they don't hear the gospel. They're condemned for their sin, and they're, they're culpable for their sin because they know God exists, and they know what he wants, and they still sin against him. So if everybody knows, and they're without excuse, the question again arises, well, why do we need apologetics? Paul tells us in verse 19, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It's not because there isn't enough evidence. It's because men try to hide the evidence. They don't want to face God. Jesus said that this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. And they wouldn't come to the light because their deeds would be exposed, their evil deeds. That's the reason why we have atheists writing books trying to convince themselves and other people that God does not exist. So they build arguments against it. Well, we have to be able to answer those arguments. R.C. strongly believes it was the job of every Christian at whatever level we can to offer argumentation. And certainly the, the, in his case, the professionally trained apologist needs to answer all the objections raised against Christianity. And that's the reason why we should study and review the arguments why we should pray for opportunities to share these things with other people, and why we should pray for them, okay? That these things would continually press down on them and convict them until it drives them 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's the reason why God gave us a conscience and why he gives us time is to drive us to look for a way out of the predicament that we know that we're in, okay? So we need to pray that we'll have the opportunity to share these things and that the Lord would convict them through these things. When they are convicted by these things, that's called awakening, okay? When God awake, awakens them, makes them concerned, we need to pray that the evidence that's there, even if we don't share it, would weigh down on them and convict them. Now, again, that is not going to lead them to Christ. Uh, you know, I think we understand that the gospel is not out there. And so that brings us to our last point. There are things general revelation cannot show us, such as how to have our sins forgiven. You can't read that on the stars. You can't deduce that from... Uh, what we know about God, you may be able to deduce that, that He is patient and that His patience is for a reason. Maybe He has way, made a way of escape, but we can't know what that way is and how to come into a relationship with Him without the Bible. We need special revelation. So next time, you know, from here, what we're going to do is uh, review the arguments uh, that we've seen already that the Bible is you know, God's Word, and we're going to dive a little bit more deeply into that to explore some of those, um, some of those evidences. And, and again, from there, we, I hope, seeing perhaps with, with greater certainty, although our, our greatest assurance comes from the Holy Spirit working within us, it will make us spend more time uh, looking, you know, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and seeking to see God and, and to know Him. Uh, through it. Well, let's, um, let's close this time with another hymn. And uh, this hymn is based on the psalm that I've read for our call to worship. And so that we might be able to sing it tonight, uh, or at least for I might be able to play it tonight, I'm going to play it to a tune. This is not one that's very familiar to us, which is why I can't play it. So I'm going to play it to a tune that we are familiar with so that we can sing it and benefit from it. So it's called, The Heavens Declare Your Glory, Lord. So why don't we stand as we sing this in closing. And again, you'll, you'll recognize the